So uh, children's time is going to resume in August, but if Don's video was any indication of his creative potential, I think we should uh, have Don do a video once a week too. That was awesome. If you, if you were not yet in the sanctuary, um, I'm sure we'll put it online. It was really funny. I'll just, I'll just leave, that, leave it at that. Is it, that's a tease. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the second week of our little mini-series on one of my favorite scriptures, which is Paul's letter to the Philippians. All four of the chapters of this brief letter are terrific. They're extremely quotable. If you've never sat down and read the entire letter slash book at one sitting, I'd highly recommend it. And I mentioned last Sunday that there are a bunch of verses from Philippians that, that have been and remain important uh, in my own spiritual journey. There were actually two in last week's re- uh, passage from the first chapter, even though I only focused on one of them. In the very opening verses of Philippians, Paul writes, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. I love that sense of optimism, that sense of hope. Um, that's not always the way Paul shows up in his letters, and so for him to open a letter like that is awesome, but that's actually not the verse that I focused on last week. We spent a little bit more time with uh, a phrase from the 27th verse, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And we talked about last, last week, we talked about uh, what that looks like, responding to God's grace by loving others, Uh, especially within the context of the community of faith. Now, the second chapter of Philippians, which we're actually skipping today, is also chock full of awesome stuff. It opens with a a very famous passage called the Christ Hymn. The Christ Hymn is such an important piece of scripture that in our North Texas annual conference, everyone who is seeking to be ordained as a deacon or elder in the United Methodist Church is required to, to preach a sermon on it, record it, and submit it for evaluation (laughs) before they can enter residency. Because Paul's theology in these verses uh, is just central to our approach to the Christian life. That's a a passage that talks about having the mind of Christ, which is a mind of humility and a mind of selflessness. And then, right after those awesome verses, that, uh, that section called the Christ hymn, There's another famous, crucially important verse, one that's another one of my favorites. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul is encouraging us in that verse, or those two verses actually, to think through our faith and to make it our own, and he's promising that God is with us in that Uh, intellectual and spiritual journey. I mean, that's awesome. And that's like in, I don't know, 30 some odd verses. Uh, There's so much terrific theology that runs through the entire letter to the Philippians. Well, today we're turning our attention to the second half of Philippians. We're going to focus on just a few verses from the third and fourth chapters. And the inspiration for this sermon The inspiration for me in choosing these verses actually comes from our Christ United Youth Choir. They let our music at the 945 service. Uh, They are blessing us in this service as well. At the end of the service, we're going to bless them before they go on their choir tour. And the theme for that tour is, as Brian mentioned, resilience, which I think is actually kind of perfect for this particular tour because, according to Merriam-Webster, Uh, Resilience is, quote, an ability to recover from or easily adjust to misfortune or change. And as it turns out, resilience, the word comes from a a Latin word that means to rebound or to, to bounce back. In other words, resilience is all about how we respond when something bad or challenging or unexpected happens, which... Uh, really is what this entire year has been about for these kids in youth choir. Here at Christ United, the legacy of our youth choir began with Pat Messick. Uh, If you're new to our community of faith, uh, you may not know, Pat was the director of music here for over four decades. When he retired two years ago, we named the the music wing after him, and he was a, a beloved figure to generations of Christ United families. Uh, Pat, as I think most of you know, uh, died unexpectedly 
last month, many of you have been asking about a memorial service. Uh, Pat's wishes were actually for a private family service at his home in Alabama, which was held last weekend. But uh, we will indeed be celebrating his life and legacy here at Christ United. We announced this week that we're going to have uh, a memorial concert um, in his honor to be held on the evening of Sunday, November 7th. So more details about that are going to be forthcoming, but that's going to be a, a, a beautiful service, beautiful celebration. You're not going to want to miss it. All of that is to say that Pat's vision and passion were what laid the foundation of our youth choir decades ago. It was a foundation that was then subsequently built upon uh, by youth, youth choir directors when Pat decided to delegate that particular portion of his ministry. You know, if you've been around here for a while, that our youth choir program has thrived for years. And if you've been around for a while, you also know that the uh, youth choir tour is a staple of our summer calendar and that every su one Sunday every summer, uh, like today, we celebrate their music and their ministry. Now, we typically do it when they return from the tour as a kind of homecoming. Today, we're doing it as a, as a send-off for them. Well, as with everything else in our lives, uh, the pandemic disrupted that tradition last year. Our kids could not go on tour last summer. And not only that, you may remember that at the beginning of the pandemic, our youth choir director moved. And so this time last year was a time of tremendous uncertainty and challenge and unexpected change for our kids. They had ended the year, the school year, uh, entirely online. We all remember that. We had not yet hired a new youth choir director. We were not even worshiping together in person as a community of faith. If ever there was a time that called for resilience, this was it. If ever there was a school year that called for resilience, this was it. And as it turns out, uh, the Apostle Paul knew something about the importance of resilience. So that leads to our first reading for today. This is the from the third chapter of Philippians, uh, verses 13 through 15. Listen, friends, for the word of God as it is proclaimed by God's servant, the Apostle Paul. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. I press on toward the goal, for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we talked last week about how Paul had a great deal of affection for the church at Philippi. The Philippians uh, were a strong congregation. They were a faithful congregation. They continued to support Paul in his ministry in other areas after he founded the church at Philippi. And we talked last week about how Paul is writing to the Philippians from prison. In the verses before what we just read, Paul talks about what his commitment to Christ had cost him. We know from the historical record that Paul suffered mightily for, his gospel, for the gospel, suffered mightily for his insistence on preaching the gospel, no matter what. We know that he was imprisoned multiple times. We know that he suffered beatings and other persecutions multiple times. He makes reference in that third chapter, a little bit earlier in that third chapter, to this ongoing controversy that was just a continual source of angst in his ministry, this, this theological disagreement he had with those who believed that converts to Christianity should have to follow some form of the Jewish law. He was adamant that that was not true, and it was a major argument in the early years of the church. He spends a few verses earlier in that third chapter then acknowledging to this community of believers with whom he shared such a uniquely wonderful bond that the life of faith is not all sunshine and unicorns. And then he picks up the, the theme for us for today, which is resilience. The life of faith, just like life in general, has its share of challenges and hardships and difficulties. The question is not uh, whether bad things will happen, right? We all know bad things happen. The question is how we bounce back from them when they do, and much more to the point for us today, the question is 
uh, what is it that gives us our strength and hope and confidence to bounce back? What is it that gives us resilience? And Paul's point is that as disciples, our resilience comes from our faith in Christ. And it's, it's strengthened by the community of believers who walk with us through it all. It's both and for Paul. It's Christ and the community of faith. This one thing I do, Paul writes, in the context of all this hardship that he had endured, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. (laughs) And then he says, let those of us who are mature, meaning mature in the faith, be of the same mind. I really do love this letter. I mean, Paul was clearly on fire with faith and with inspiration, and it just, it pours out in so many of these verses. Now, I mean, look, the the pandemic has been hard on all of us, right? Uh, But I do think that it has been uniquely difficult for our kids. We adults have the benefit of perspective since we've gone around the sun a few more times than the children in our lives. That, that, maturity, that perspective gives us um, the confidence that this too shall pass, right? I mean, having, having one year disrupted out of the 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or however many years we've been around, that's one thing. And it's hard enough to be sure. I'm not minimizing anybody's uh, suffering, anybody's, what anybody's gone through. But having an entire year disrupted out of the 15 or 10 or five that we've been around is quite another thing entirely that can feel catastrophic for kids. Back in May, the Lurie Children, uh, Children's Hospital of Chicago conducted a nationwide survey of parents, and they found that 71% of parents believed that the pandemic had taken a toll on their child's mental health. They found that 69% said the pandemic was the the worst thing that had happened to their child, and social isolation was consistently cited as by far the most unhealthy aspect of the pandemic for their kids. Uh, For the past year, our kids have spent countless hours on Zoom. I don't know how many hours y'all spent on Zoom. That's a lot. And you're probably not anxious to get back on Zoom anytime soon, right? Yeah. Uh, They've been in and out of quarantine. If you've got a kid in school, you know that they've been in and out of quarantine if somebody gets COVID. Uh, they've had to, to manage the strangeness of masks and physical distancing. And while many of us, myself included, adults, have gotten grumpy about masks, uh, the kids have handled all that with, with tremendous grace, if you ask me. Uh, researchers are no doubt going to be studying the effects of the pandemic for years to come, and some of the impact won't be known for years, but whatever future studies may tell us, anyone with a child in their life can certainly attest to the the unexpected challenges that the past 16 months have have presented to them. And I'm totally biased on this, for sure, but I think that, that all of us who are blessed to call this place home saw proof of what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians almost 2,000 years ago now. Those of us who've been able to keep our kids active in our children's and our youth ministries throughout the pandemic have seen how their faith in Christ and how their fellowship with one another have helped them to persevere. And as the parent, a parent of a youth in the loft today, I'm especially grateful this morning for our, our youth choir. When Brian Stenson arrived as our Associate Director of Music for Children and Youth late last summer, uh, he inherited a rich legacy I've already talked about. Uh, And then he built upon that legacy in this most unusual year. The kids that you see up here were able to gather weekly for rehearsals. They were able to sing regularly for worship. I know we've all been blessed by that. They've been able to prepare for the tour that starts bright and early tomorrow morning, and along the way, um, they've grown in their faith. 
Uh, they've internalized their theology by singing it each week. <laughs> I've got a front row seat to this, so I can attest to it. And they've shared that Christian fellowship that Paul is so adamant is so central to the life of faith. And here's what I want to say about all that. This isn't all about them. <laughs> because all of that is made possible by you. <laughs> by their congregation. Because it's, it's you who provides the staff and the space and the encouragement for these kids. It's you who attends their fundraisers, encourages your kids and your grandkids and your nieces and your nephews and all the children in your life to join the choir and participate in our ministries, which means that you, you have helped these kids bounce back from a tougher year than any of us could have imagined. That is the beauty and power of being part of a community of faith. Okay, we cannot end a study of Philippians without one verse in particular. It's a verse you may know. I don't have to open my Bible to say it, but I think we're going to show it on the screen. Um, and I would love for us to all say this together, if you would please join me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do which things? All things through him who strengthens me. I don't know how many times I've said that over the years. It's a lot. Um, you know, you, you, I may or may not be gifted in memorizing long passages of scripture. That certainly is a go-to. <laughs> because in a short letter that has lots of memorable, quotable verses, man, this one may be the most powerful. I don't, I don't know. It certainly feels like it sometimes. It's one to turn to at all times, to be sure, but never more so than in bad times, in challenging times, in times of unexpected change and stress. And as Paul makes clear throughout the entire letter to the Philippians, his point is that both our faith in Christ and the fellowship of the church, it's both, give us the resilience to bounce back from whatever life throws at us. And God knows life's thrown a lot at us <laughs> over the past 16 months. Think back to all that we've endured. As a community of faith, we have uplifted one another. We've gotten through this thing together. Christ has seen us through it, as Christ always does, because that's kind of Christ's thing. And today, especially, we celebrate how through your membership vows, the membership vows that we all take when we join a congregation to support and uphold this congregation of the United Methodist Church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, those vows have enabled these young people to grow in their music, to grow in their faith, to grow in their fellowship, which has been that's never a small thing. It's especially not a small thing over the past year. Tomorrow morning, bright and early, on our behalf, <laughs> on your behalf, they're, they're leaving on tour to bear witness to the love of Christ, which is a love that they have learned here at Christ United. And Brian mentioned some of the details. They're, they're going to be singing at a nursing home in Little Rock. They're going to be singing at a, a senior living center in Memphis for folks who themselves are trying to bounce back from extended isolation during the pandemic. They're going to be singing at uh, the Union Mission Women's Shelter in Memphis for women and their children who have survived domestic abuse who absolutely need the resilience that Christ offers us. They'll be singing the national anthem at a minor league baseball game at the home of the Memphis Redbirds. I'm assuming we're going to do that for the Rough Riders at some point, too. Why not? Okay, all right. Why not the Rangers at this point? Oh, a Rangers, even better. Yes, that is even better. Love it. Yes, love that. And they're going to be participating in a choral clinic at the University of Memphis. And all along the way, for the first time in two years, they're going to be taking their faith on the road, sharing the love of Christ through their passion for music. And they're able to do that, Paul would say, because of their faith in Christ and their friendships with each other. And I would add, because of the love and support 
of their church family, all of which has given them the resilience to do what they love and to bless others in the doing. Friends, man, I, I was going to say there's not a whole lot that I believe more than, and that may be, that's true, more than the fact, the truth, the theological truth that Paul tells us that we can do all things through him who strengthens us. And as Paul makes clear, that strength is best lived out in the context of a community of believers. I, I don't know about you, but I give thanks to God that I am part of a congregation that invests so much in ministries like our youth choir. And I hope that you're going to encourage, that you do and will continue to uh, encourage all the children in your life to be part of our children's and youth ministries. And I know that you'll be in prayer for our kids and their adult chaperones this week as they're on tour on behalf of Christ United.